On today's episode of the Fandom Science Podcast, is clutch performance in sports a real thing or is it a myth like some studies would suggest? What state of mind does the athlete need to be in for them to rise to the occasion and make that big clutch play? And are there some personality traits that clutch players have and others don't? We talk about that and a lot more with Dr. Mark Otten from California State University. As always, I really hope you enjoy this episode. And if you do, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to the podcast for interesting sports science content. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy. So before we get going, could you just tell us a little bit about how you got started in sports psychology and what made you choose this exact area to, to focus on? Uh, yeah, I mean, the short story is I, I met John Wooden one day. That's, that's the short story. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> that was about 2004. Um, and yeah, it, I, uh, um, as an undergrad, I was a statistics major, um, but I was a sports fan, sort of like an athlete kind of, uh, like for my lifestyle. And so then, um, you know, that's where I can, that's the background I came from. And then I wanted to apply some of the stats that I was learning to something meaningful, um, like, or something that I figured might be meaningful. And so Mm -hmm. then I chose psychology because I figured helping people and helping others was a through psychology research uh, might be an outlet for that. And then, um, my, about my second or third year in graduate school, I, um, I was a TA for a sports psychology class. I still hadn't picked it up as, as my primary area of study, but when I was a TA, I, um, learned more about the, the whole thing and all the different options that it, um, might allow for and then yeah and then uh coach wooden was brought in as a guest speaker because i was at ucla and he was 93 years old and i got to chat with him for a little bit because i was the ta and yeah so that was the clincher kind of that's awesome and then that's when you decided like okay clutch performance that's my thing uh it was a little bit after that I, i that was when i decided that sports psychology was my thing and then i started to read the literature and um I mean, I, you know, I was a, I was a nerd for sports growing up. I, I had observed lots of clutch performances. Um, you know, I knew they were called clutch performances from just having been a fan. Um, I was a 49er fan when I was a kid. So I knew about Joe Montana, for example, you know, and, uh, and so then I started reading the literature and all the literature was like, Oh, anxiety is terrible. Oh, like, athletes always choke under pressure and we get need to do all we can to prevent anxiety. And I was like, wait a minute, that's probably not what Joe Montana would say. He'd probably say, well, when it gets to the Super Bowl, it's like super fun and this is like awesome. And so then um, nobody was talking about clutch performance in the literature. And so I thought that was like a no brainer to study that because, you know, people were telling me, oh, just find your niche, find something that hasn't been studied before. And I was like, well, I mean, I, so I guess it came really from just being a sports fan, you know, and knowing about clutch performances, but then not finding it in the literature. So it was probably 2005 or six, a couple of years after meeting coach Wooden. That's awesome. It's easily one of the coolest areas in, in sports psychology. Um, and I think it's one that we, as sports fans, like we most relate to because we see it, these big moments, they, they create like imprints in our, in our minds. And so it's yeah. definitely one of the coolest things to study. Um, mm-hmm. Firstly, I'm I'm just wondering about what your own personal definition of clutch performance is, because it seems like people are conflicted on it. Like there's not one definition. Um, is it simply maintaining your performance when you're under pressure or is it when you elevate your performance in, in those high pressure situations? I think it's more like elevating. Um, maintaining would be like preventing a choke, basically, um, which is like you can prevent a choke, but you can also go the other way and actually improve your skills. I, I took the, I, for my, when I wrote about this for my dissertation, I just took um, the definition that had been put out there for choking, which was like performance decrements, like getting worse under pressure. And I just said, well, let's just say it's getting better under pressure. And so, um, yeah. And then I didn't try to make it more complicated than that. And then I, but it's, it's really cool that, people have been debating it, I think, because it does deserve a little bit more um, clarification. So I don't have a strong opinion on how to clarify it other than it's, it is, I think, getting better than performing better than usual, specifically when there's pressure, as opposed to just 
not joking. Yeah, I think getting caught up in the definition, like it's interesting as a as a debate and a discussion to have, but also ultimately the the value behind it is like understanding how we can how you can instill that in the athlete, how you can predict that. I think that's the most uh, interesting thing. Sure. But um, sure. Just about the definition, just one more thing. I think I can see both sides of the argument as to which definition I have because. Let's say Steph Curry shoots um, 47% field goal percentage in, in the regular season. And then he shoots 47% again in the conference finals and the finals. Um, mm-hmm. You could look at the number and say, well, it's the same. So he maintained his performance. He didn't elevate it. But, right. you know, in the conference finals, the finals, you're facing much tighter defense, much higher quality competition. Mm-hmm. So even if the number looks the same, he technically might have elevated his performance just to, you know, keep that at the level. True. True. Uh, yeah, you could you could look at that statistically. You could control for uh, like who's guarding him, um, which I've always um, had a hard time finding specific defensive statistics for basketball. But um, but yeah, you could definitely and look at you know the uh, the team defense and the you know the opponent things like that too. Yeah. Um, so if you can c- control for that and show that hey he's he's maintained his performance while uh, the opponent has gotten tougher, then yeah, I would say that could qualify as clutch too. Yeah. I'm not sure if you could, uh, I'm not too well versed in, in NBA uh, advanced stats, but I know like in baseball or in hockey, you can definitely qu- uh, control for quality of competition. So that's interesting. But yeah, yeah again, the definition, not so much as, as the actual value. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. lots of studies in, in baseball um, have said that if clutch performance is actually a real thing, then it would be consistent year to year. But then a lot of those studies found that it's mostly a random effect. It's not actually something real. Other studies in basketball, for example, and also some other baseball studies found that, no, it is actually a real thing. There are actually, you know, clutch players who you can rely on. Where do you stand on this debate? Well, we did a couple of studies on just um, individual and team different scores. So like, um, take Steph Curry, for example, if, you know, he shoots 47% in the playoffs, 47% in the regular season, it'd be a different score of zero. And so we tried to identify guys that went up and also went down over time. Um, so, you know, you can identify what appears to be a clutch performance, right? If let's say, um, I, earlier, you know, when I was first starting out, Robert Ory was a big deal because he kept having these playoff performances, including, beating the Sacramento Kings, which at the time was my favorite team. So Not anyway, uh, well, yeah, and still, still, I just, they are terrible. Uh, Maybe you, don't, year, you but, can't admit that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> they are still my, yes, they, they're my favorite team. Uh, anyway, but Robert Ory would be an example of somebody who may not shoot as well during the season as he does in the, in the playoffs. Um, and so... Anyway, so I, if you label him a clutch performer because of that, you can go to the statistics. But I think also there's some good research out there where um, I don't know if you've looked up. Um, I know you talked to Chris Masanya, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's um, there's another the next episode. Oh, the next one. Okay. Um, yeah. So you can see what he thinks. But there's another group in Australia to Christian Swan and his group. Um, they've been doing some stuff looking at like qualitative and. Uh, accounts of clutch performances by athletes um where they you know they ask athletes about it and they athletes a lot of them say you know recount clutch performances from their past so so i think on that so you can look at it like on the macro like statistics level you know big leagues full of statistics or you could look at it by just asking athletes about it um and i think either way you're going to come up with more than I, I mean, everything in statistics is random. I wouldn't say it's like not random because it kind of is just like everything else is. <laughs> it's just hard to, like, if you build a regression model, it's hard to account for a ton of the percentage in people's behavior just because of so much of it is random. But, but anyway, I, I would say that the clutch effect is there and how you measure it, um, uh, whether you're able to detect it depends on how you measure it. Yeah, I think it's it gets really tough to kind of measure one thing because you know such a detailed thing, especially in sports, because there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of randomness, yeah, and it's tough to yeah. pinpoint one thing. 
Um, but speaking, I would, of, I would argue, I would just add briefly that it's as real as choking, though. For me, I think choking is as random as clutch is. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's interesting because I, <laughs> I guess it's like if you think of a performance as this like linear line, one side of it is clutch, one side of it is choking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that would be my feeling. Right. Uh, so speaking about the psychology a little bit. Uh, side of things could you take us through the psychology of clutch performance like what state of mind is the athlete in when they're you know clutch performing well yeah i mean i guess i don't have all the answers on this but um i've studied it as much as the next guy um yeah i mean i so my dissertation uh published 2009 it was quite a while ago we did we did a lot of um i did a lot of lit review on this and so i uncovered some things like um, uh, confidence and specifically confidence in your sport. Um, uh, not overthinking it. So there's this thing called reinvesting attention where you're like ruminating and like overthinking it. Um, that's not good. Um, and then some other things we found like, um, uh, uh, perception, either perceived control or a feeling of intuition kind of just going to be awesome. Um, those sorts of things. That's what we studied back then. And then since then, we've kind of, I've had some students come through my lab wanting to study different pieces of this, including mindfulness and um, uh, different uh, predict possible predictors of clutch performance. And really, I keep coming back to this idea of control, like, um, which can go along with confidence. If you're confident, you're more likely to feel like hey, it's just going to go well. I don't know why it's going to go well. It's just going to go well. And then, um, and then positive thinking as a result. I think those are the things that uh, sort of are central to what we've studied over the years. All right. So I think we're going to like dissect each part here as we go okay. on. But uh, isn't there a little bit of a, like a chicken in the egg effect here? It's uh, what comes first, the, the, the sport confidence mm, right. or that big clutch play that you make? Right. Yeah, there is definitely that. I mean, it's all correlations for the most part and not like you know, one comes before the other. Uh, in our original experimental studies, we did do some questionnaire work where we asked people about their confidence, like first, and then we didn't, they didn't know what they were going to be doing. And then they performed well in the clutch. So you can kind of establish it as a cause a little bit there. Um, the control piece in that study was a little bit like, it was definitely chicken and the egg. It was like, they performed well. And then afterwards, we asked them, about the control and they're like, Oh yeah, I was in control. So, you know, it, it was a correlation more than a like cause and effect. Um, I would say, but, um, but, uh, you know, that's part of the puzzle, right? Like you feel good. Therefore you perform well, you pre perform well, you realize you're performing well in the moment. And then you're like, Oh man, I'm awesome. And then you keep going, you're able to sustain it. So, yeah. And then the same happens when you, when you blow it in a game and then it's, it goes downhill, yeah. same, same as it goes uphill. Yeah. You um, airball a shot and you're like, eh, yeah, I might do that again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you just mentioned reinvestment and this is something that I haven't been able to wrap my head around. Um, how does it relate to clutch performance? Or, or first of all, like what is reinvestment and how does it relate to clutch performance? Yeah. I mean, the short answer is just the, the piece about overthinking it. Like if you're, if you know it um, goes along with the negative correlations we see with um, explicit knowledge, which is like um, you know you're uh, you know the fundamentals, you know where to stand and how to hold your arm and everything when you're shooting a free throw. But then, if you're thinking about those things explicitly, then you're in trouble. Um, so yeah, the reinvestment specifically, I think. I don't know. Like we haven't emphasized it as much in more, my more recent research because that questionnaire that um, you might have seen in the literature is kind of weird. It's like I look at my mirror myself in the mirror in the morning a lot. I haven't and seen I'm that like, questionnaire. What? No. Well, what are they trying? Okay. To yeah. Measure? Check it out. Reinvestment of attention. It's it's a it's like there's pieces to it. There's a self consciousness piece, um, and there's a couple others, but um, it's it doesn't have to do with sports. And so then to find a correlation is kind of cool but also kind of questionable so um anyway i but if you just call it like overthinking it or ruminating then it, then it starts to make a little more sense and i think there's also room in the literature to add a new questionnaire on like sport specific rumination or whatever we call it want to call it 
Mm. And r- by rumination, you mean like when you start to dwell on on things that are going wrong, and and the yeah. you know the feeling of anxiety. Like when you get so involved in that, it takes you out of the moment, kind of thing. Exactly. It could even be a good thing, like you know, you drain a three pointer with three minutes left in the game to give your team the lead, and then you're like, oh crap, I just did that whoa and then you like look around and you become aware of your surroundings and you rethink things a little bit and then um and then you kind of take yourself out of your clutch state or your flow state mm. so i guess it works both ways it's like uh you, you know when you get too low on yourself or when you get too high on yourself and that uh, that affects how you perform optimally or you just yeah you start thinking too much you know mm-hmm. but I, that's a, also another study that could be done is uh, positive rumination versus negative rumination is overthinking it always bad or is it actually sometimes good to realize that you just drained that amazing three pointer and think, wow, I'm going to do that again. That's a, That's an open question too. So overthinking it is bad, but if, if you're overthinking it in a good way, theory says it's bad too, but we don't know for sure. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so this is something you just alluded to briefly, but when pressure goes up, um, performance anxiety obviously also goes up, and then that causes the athlete to start paying a lot of attention to their step-by-step movement, and that can throw them off their game. So you mentioned in one of your studies, and you kind of just mentioned it briefly, is explicit versus implicit knowledge. So could you explain what those two mean and, and how they relate to performance? Yeah, so explicit is just kind of like what you're saying. Um, you know, I, when I'm shooting a free throw, I know that my feet are going to be here. It's, it's fundamentals, right? And my, my arms are here and I'm going to be bending my knees this way, take a deep breath, like the process. Um, and that's true of any skill in, in sports. Um, there's going to be explicit knowledge of what, what it is. Um, but then to be thinking about that and, um, going back over it in your mind is probably not the best when you're in the moment trying to give a clutch performance. And so then, the flip side is implicit knowledge, which is more the intuitive, like feeling that you're just going to do like, uh, some athletes will, will just like, they'll be asked about it afterwards. Like, Oh, how did you feel while you were on fire? Uh, the athlete is like, I, I don't know. I, I, it's like the, the old Michael Jordan shrug game. You know what I'm talking about? Like 1991, I think it was. Um, where he was just on fire in the first half of the NBA finals game. And then he turns to the sideline and he just shrugs. He's like, I don't know why it's going in. That's implicit knowledge, basically, in a nutshell. Yeah, because you hear it all the time when they interview athletes, especially after big, big plays, big moments. It's like, what was going through your mind? You know, what did you do here and there? And they're just like, oh, I don't know. I just kind of did my thing. Like the thing I always do. I just did that. I didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and if so you, be, if you really believe that you always do it, then that's like even better, you know? And so that's, that would be implicit is when you do what you, what's ingrained in your mind, what you're, what you've practiced to do without deviating too much from it, without focusing on like every step, everything. So that, that would be implicit. That would be implicit. Yeah. And then there's a piece of it for clutch performance where it's like, you're doing what you've always done. And then also there's a little extra push, like now's my time to show it now's my time to shine kind of thing so yeah. you're not just doing it like always you're doing it and you're showing it off or you're you know mm-hmm. this is it's more important now and so you feel more inspired something like that that kind of like relates to this concept like expertise induced amnesia where it's mm-hmm. like you ask a, you ask a top golfer it's like break down your swing for me and he goes, oh, I don't know. You kind of just like grab the club like this and you go like this and all that. He's not going to break it down like every step by step at the micro level because it's so ingrained in him. He became such an expert that it's it's almost like an amnesia. So I think maintaining yeah. that is is optimal for, for clutch performance. Yeah. I mean, capturing that in the, in the right moment. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily the best for like practice. Like if you're out on the driving range and you're like trying to learn something. And this guy's like out there coaching you and you're like, give me some tips. And he's like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, in practice, you want to be able to pull out that explicit kind of knowledge. But, uh, but yeah, when, when the, when you're at the 18th green or whatever, trying to win the tournament, you mm-hmm. want to revert back. 
So is that what self-focus is? Is that what uh, sports psychology refers to as self-focus? Or is that something else? Because I've, I've seen also in the literature how it also impacts performance, especially in the clutch. But again, I haven't been able to wrap my head around it, which is not surprising because I can't wrap my head around a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, well, so yeah, self-focus, I mean, they're all, they're all related. They're all kind of correlated, right? Like there's self-consciousness is in there too. Um, self-focus is like, I mean, the, the way they, they manipulated it in one study was they had a mirror, uh, put up under the basket. So the people are shooting free throws and they were looking at themselves, um, which threw them off, not unexpectedly, mm. <laughs> or, you know, they, there's fans that dance around, you know, behind the basket during games and it's sort of the distraction element, but, um, but yeah, self-focus is, is part of, um, focusing too much on explicit knowledge, um, and ruminating. They're all kind of similar concepts. Um, my dissertation study, we didn't find a strong self-focus effect, but we did find effects of the other, uh, measures that we just, um, that I just mentioned. Um, but yeah, the definition of it is you're focused on yourself, you're in your own head, um, and you're not focused on the task or something external. Right. So uh, I don't know if you saw in the finals, like the Raptors have this super fan now, mm. um, mm. he always, you know, does things via behind the board to throw people off when they're taking free yeah. shot. Uh, it makes me throws. miss basketball, man. I, I need to get I know. Some sports back. <laughs> I know. Well, apparently it's, uh, it's looking good. They're coming back. Uh, they're putting together those, so. yeah, those proposals looking good. So instead of you know doing all that thing, carrying those signs, he could just hold a mirror and let you know Giannis look at himself, and he'll that'll throw him off his game. Theoretically, according to that one study, I think it was about two thousand one or so they did that. Um, yeah. yeah, but then they were right below the basket, so I don't know if like he'd have to yeah. like come like next maybe, to the photographers and like <laughs> yeah. Although, yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 you don't have to distract Giannis because he just put a bricks in the series. Um, <laughs> I, I, I suspect that you're a Raptor fan. I'm not, like, I wouldn't say I'm a, like, a huge Raptor. I, I don't have a favorite team, okay. but it was nice to I see think. them win. Yeah. I see. Hometown right. team, you know. Okay. Um, so, speaking of, we mentioned earlier some personality traits. Um, aside from, you know, uh, we mentioned the confidence control, all that, are there some personality traits that actually can tell you in advance whether this player is going to be clutch or not? It's, it, that's a hard, it's like six degrees of separation, right? You, you, if somebody's feeling in control, we think that that's a strong indicator. Why would they feel in control? Because they're confident in their sport. Why would they be confident in their sport? Because they're a confident person. So that's like separation, right? But like you could be a confident person, but not be confident in your sport. Or maybe you could be not a confident person and confident in your sport. You know, there's, yeah, it's just separation in there. So, um, yeah, people have asked me like, you know, do you think we should use some personality tests, like recommend them for the NBA draft, you know, combine or NFL or whatever. Um, psychologists tend to shy away from recommending that. Um, just How because come? they don't want, yeah, it, it's a lot. I, I'm not exactly sure, but it's a lot of, um, you know, correlational research, like, like we were talking about the chicken or the egg. Um, so somebody, for example, could be not that confident seeming, and then all of a sudden they have a big year in the, their rookie year. And then now all of a sudden they're confident. So I feel like personality and feelings of control are pretty changeable. And so where I would fall on this is anyone can kind of learn how to be clutch if they're given the right coaching and the right, um, you know, uh, adopt the right mindset. Um, that said, if you're a confident person and if you have been playing the game uh, a long time, things like that, you're, um, uh, you've had good coaches that aren't too negative. Like that, that's another element. Like if you're, if you're a positive thinker, that's why I see some of these like youth sport events and these coaches are like yelling at the players and it's, some of it's negative. I'm like, eh, that's not what you want. I don't know. So if you're, if you're confident and if you're, um, if you're a positive thinker, right. An optimist, I, I might start there for, for personality. 
And so you think positive thinking has has an impact on it because, like you said, maybe six degrees of separation is like thinking positively, maybe boosts your confidence, boosting your confidence lowers or maybe increases control, uh, increasing control leads to clutch kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I would say my, my top recommendation is that at this point is to not rely too much on judging somebody's personality, <laughs> then judge them as potentially successful in, in their sport or clutch performer. But, um, but yeah, I would say if you're a confident person, I mean, you know, you can look at Kobe Bryant, some of these legends of confidence, right? Michael Jordan, um, they were confident. They are confident. And that, that's a, that's a nice, um, head start, right. To being a clutch performer. And it might even translate to other parts of their life too, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, because that was going to be my next uh, question is like, if there are some, you know, uh, concrete personality traits that predict clutch performance, then you could potentially screen for him at the draft and know, you know, if I take this guy, then, you know, when, when things get tough, he's going to show up for me. I just wouldn't do it. I don't know. (laughs) It's not worth it, huh? Well, I mean, I, I just feel like, you know, if you're at the draft and then you've got this young, young guy, that's like, doesn't seem very confident, right. Would you stay away from him? Well, you could, but then like, maybe you get him in there with a good coach his first year who builds him up a lot. And Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're young, your confidence can change. Right. So I, I would just, I would just think that anyone can learn to be clutch. Um, granted you have at the draft, some guys that have just come out of college and won national championships and made numerous clutch shots for their college team or whatever, those guys, you know, I mean, there's more data (laughs) on those guys, right? Like they've already proven themselves. So, you know, a guy like um, uh, Mario Chalmers from Kansas a number of years ago, hit the game winning shot. And then that guy Mm -hmm. for Villanova, um, I forgot his name. He hit the game winning shot for the national champions. You know, these guys like, uh, yeah, I would say they're probably pretty extra confident coming into pro basketball um, just based on their own experience. So, yeah, you could take a flyer on one of those guys. But anyway. So, yeah, so that's interesting. So it's not necessarily this innate ability that you either have or you don't have. It's something maybe with proper uh, sports psychology training, maybe with proper actual coaching you can develop in you. You can add it to your repertoire. And that, and thus, thus my plug for uh, more sports psychologists on staff for some of these proteins. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're moving in that direction. It seems like everybody's got one. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, you can also um, see a lot of what, like what, a lot of what coaches do overlaps with what sports psychologists do. So um, I've recently, I've been trying to advocate for more um, crossover there. Like, let's have a coaching conference where some sports psychologists go, or let's have a sports psychology conference where more coaches go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you about this. So like a popular concept in, in sports psych is obviously athletic identity. And for anybody that's not familiar with it, it's kind of like the degree to which a person self identifies as an athlete, uh, has a big impact on how they conduct themselves in their day to day life, how they live, how they train, um, so the same, could the same apply to being clutch? It's like when you self identify as a player, um, as being a clutch guy, does that feed into it more in those high pressure situations? Sounds like a great training tool. Like wake up in the morning, remember your clutch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every day. Your cereal, uh, your, yeah. Yeah. Or have a coach remind you or, um, uh, I mean, you, you, you know, in building those skills, you have to start somewhere. So you can't just like miss 10 game winning shots in a row and then wake up the next morning and be like, I'm clutch. Like you have mm-hmm. to, <laughs> you have to start, you know, you have to start with, have some success at some point, I think to actually believe it. Like, you know, the best way of believing it is actually having lived it. Um, so that's why I brought up those guys who made game winning shots in the, you know, championship games. Cause yeah. they, they will be like Mario Chalmers. Like the only reason I remember his name is because he did that. And like, he will forever be clutch like forever. Just like some of these guys who choked under pressure, like Chris Weber back, you know, calling a timeout in the nineties, yeah. like he came to the Kings and he was still labeled as a choker. And I was like, is he a choker? Like he just had this one bad experience. Right. Anyway. So, 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 uh, but, but training to be clutch, I think does involve, um, 
uh, positive thinking and some training that, you know, isn't just one time. It's like maybe some multiple days of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that you just uh, alluded to that. Now that was going to be my next question is like as a human brain, uh, as a human beings, our brains are largely affected by availability bias and, Again, for anybody who is not familiar, availability bias is basically um, when our minds mistakenly make judgments about someone or something based on the first easy example that pops in our head. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we can go, "This guy is a choker," or "This guy is clutch." But yeah. you know, how much of the, how much of that plays into our belief in clutch players being clutch? I think, yeah, I think it does. I mean, I you know, you can talk about perception versus reality, right? Like what does an athlete believe versus what is said about that athlete? Mm. Of course, the high, higher levels, you get athletes that are, you know, hearing about themselves all the time. Right. So then Chris Weber once a year gets reminded of this, like, you know, yeah. every, every year. So, um, but yeah, I, I do think that, um, that those labels can be powerful. Um, but they're also, um, I mean, you know, what happens if Weber gets to the NBA finals one year and makes a huge shot? Like it kind of happened for LeBron that way, right? Like LeBron early in his career struggled, I think a little bit more and under pressure mm-hmm. and people were like, ah, is he like, is he really clutch or I don't think so. And then later on he did a little better. So, um, yeah, things can change. Yeah. I think the, our perception, the media, the hype, all of that affects it. All of that gets into the into this I can coaches yeah. too. I like at the lower levels of sport, because I coach tennis, um mm-hmm. I've seen coaches really have a dramatic effect. Like if the coach says, Oh, like you're always good under pressure, that has a pretty big impact on a player sometimes. Um, or if a coach says something negative, it can have the opposite effect. So so with the higher levels, maybe pros, you know, the media, there's a lot of sources of these kinds of things. The lower levels, a coach you know, or a, a, a respected teammate could have the same kind of effect. So that's interesting. So you, you think that the more you kind of instill a thought in someone, the more they start to believe it as if it's true? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, not if you're not a respected source of information, like, right. you know, if you're playing tennis and then like your mom who has never played in her life comes in and says, Oh, you're really good. Right. Like, you know, not a big deal, but, uh, but if the coach who recruited you to be on a team and, you know, is there and trying to decide your playing time and then he compliments you, that's, that's, mm-hmm. that can be very powerful. The literature talks about like coach expectations versus player expectations and how they really are intertwined a lot of times. Sorry, could you expand a little bit more on that? So the coach expectation and the player expectations are intertwined? intertwined like you know you you're a player and you come into a season expecting to be a starter and then the coach starts you out on the bench and you're like ah like there's a disconnect there Mm -hmm. and so then you might doubt yourself you might be like well actually i do deserve to be on the bench and so then that coach expectation can really um, be powerful just just as powerful as your own expectations for success um, but then the opposite could occur too, where you feel like, oh, I'm just the backup on this team. And then the coach is like, wow, you've been playing really well. You get to start tomorrow. And you're like, huh? And then that can, um, cause you to believe in yourself more than you did before. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I think we kind of touched on this, uh, intermittently throughout the episode so far, but what can an athlete do if you were kind of to put it in, in like a, maybe a step-by-step process or maybe just a advice, what can an athlete do in their preparation and in their practice to increase the chances of them becoming more clutch in high, high pressure situations? Hire a sports psychologist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, what can they do? Yeah. I mean, I, so I've, I've been more on the descriptive side in terms of my own research and like, here's what a clutch performance looks like. Here are the um, things that correlate with it. Um, so I can't necessarily speak on my own research, but just, you know, based on, um, uh, you know, the implications, I would say uh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the things we talked about, uh, training to be confident, um, surrounding yourself with the right um, people to keep you feeling positive and upbeat and, and believing in yourself, um, being able to, uh, have a setback and not have it crush you and, you know, 
uh, some resilience there to come back. Um, so there's a lot of mental training techniques out there that are designed for these kinds of things. Like, um, uh, there's a lot of mindfulness, meditation, relaxation kind of stuff to get past the negativity and the anxiety. Um, and then for clutch play, you also want to pair that up with something positive to, you know, believe in yourself. So for example, like every morning you eat your cereal and you remind yourself that you're clutch. Um, you ask somebody who you respect to get on board with you, like your coach or your, uh, you know, um, some a teammate uh, or your favorite journalist in the press conference every day after, after every game, Kawhi Leonard goes into the press conference room and the journalist comes in and is like, Kawhi, why were you so clutch today? <laughs> you know, something like that. Just to try to like make it a habit, you know? Right. So things like that might be uh, implied by, by what I've studied. So more so kind of drilling it into your own, into your own psyche. Mm-hmm. Or make it make it part of your identity. Yeah, sometimes you can um, you can really draw on your own successes, and other times you kind of have to. What do they say? Fake it till you make it, right? Mm-hmm. Like you believe it before you actually do it. Um, yeah, I think that those things are helpful. But but yeah, sports psychologists have a lot of tools in their training to to um, you know uh, to help athletes, and so these are some of the things that they might suggest. Could you, and just on the final question, could you expand a little bit on mindfulness and its effect on uh, clutch performance or at least kind of, you know, handling anxiety in high pressure situations in the game? Yeah, I had a student who um, studied this for her thesis a few years ago and we, it was it was sort of complicated. Like, um, that, yeah, there, what, what is the effect of increasing, like doing some mindfulness training on your ability to be clutch. And we didn't quite arrive at the answer because a lot of times, like I said, mindfulness meditation, it's sort of like a clear your head of, of everything, right. And a, um, like a way of decreasing anxiety. So that's good to, if you want to prevent choking. Um, but if you want to actually take the next step and be clutch, you have to then understand the situation. You have to be, uh, you can't just clear your head completely you have to clear your head of the negativity and the ruminating but you have to be you have to know that the game is on the line you have to know this is now a clutch performance coming up right uh so that was where i was like well maybe the the clearing your head aspect is helpful if directed in the right way but not always um so i think that that's why it's a little bit complicated um and I, the, the one piece that I, that we talked about earlier was the overthinking it. Um, and so if you can be relaxed and not overthinking it, then that goes along with mindfulness training. I think a lot of times athletes will, will clear their heads in, in that way. Um, so it's definitely a, a powerful tool, med- mindfulness meditation. Um, but it's not necessarily specifically been shown to help clutch performance. Right. At least so not like- yet more so helps with decreasing the chances of you choking because you're handling anxiety uh, yeah. you know, much more efficiently. But then if you want to be clutched, then you got to take some extra steps to, to really bring it. it. That's what it seems, but we haven't, we still don't have those findings. So that's an interesting study to be had to by someone. Right. Right. And I think we covered basically everything I want to ask you. I really want to thank you again for coming on and sharing your knowledge. That was a really fun chat. I really enjoyed it. Um, anything you wanted to maybe bring up or promote, uh, Twitter handle, any website? Uh, you can just look me up, uh, Mark Otten, uh, CSUN, Cal State Northridge, uh, the greatest university in the Adore. area, <laughs> uh, yeah. in the whole world. Uh, yeah. yeah, look me up and yeah, I, I, I was just thinking before we came on, like, I'm just looking forward to participating in and observing clutch performances again because like right now it's like video games like yeah you know <laughs> although you should see so. me clutch it in, in, in war zone i see yeah yeah I, I, uh, you know, I, I actually choke all the time don't believe me i do a little bit of um mlb the show oh yeah you know like the baseball game and, yeah 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 nice <laughs> a lot of clutch going on there 
uh, I, I wouldn't say a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just try not to choke. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think it'd be uh, cool to look at it in esports too, because I think esports is like yeah. making its way into the the sports psychology, the sports science field, and I know a lot of people like to you know uh, maybe put it down, but I think I think lots of things are similar from sports to esports. Oh yeah, definitely. It's actually an opportunity right now during this year yeah. of reduced uh, physical activity to yeah. to study it, and and there's definitely like you know, a couple of times I've talked about how I haven't, like, I haven't seen a study of mindfulness, clutch performance. I definitely haven't seen a study of esports and clutch performance. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that's certainly publishable soon because so many people participate. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the same variables we talked about would be relevant. Like, you know, like if you're confident and feeling in control. Yeah. And I think uh, esports is just, becoming this multi, I don't know if it's multi-billion, like uh, like professional sports, but it's definitely a multi-million dollar business. There's a lot, it's definitely there's, serving there's us. a lot on, on, on the line. Yeah, and it's definitely serving us well during the stay-at-home period. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, after this, I'm going to go play some Warzone, so there you go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks a lot again for taking the time. Really appreciate it, and I had a lot of fun chatting. Yeah, no worries.